and welcome. This is a bonus mini episode of the Serpent Temple podcast. This week we're basically just going to be losing our fucking minds talking about the new Dune film and books and TV series and David Lynch film et al. So we and Floyd and Shem, we went to the IMAX last week um, and we picked the wrong seats because I read the um, floor plan backwards. Um, (laughs) So we were looking up at the film for most of the time, but we still had a pretty good time. It was my first IMAX experience ever. And boy, was it good. It's a big ass screen, isn't it? The screen has a very large ass, yes. Do you know what? It's (laughs) funny. It's funny though, like when I looked at the seating plan, I would have done the exact same thing as you. <laughs> it's so, so stupid. So I remember when you posted that, I was like, oh yeah, they're good seats. <laughs> Everyone was like, yeah, those are at the yeah. top. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't until we were in and we were like looking at it, it was like, wait, the screen is on the other side yeah. of the floor plan. Because <laughs> we walked all the way to the back first. Yeah, we walked all the way to the back and then we had to like do this awkward crossing. And by then everyone had sat down. We were like so full of us. I was like, yeah, we're first. We're going to yeah. get our seats, <laughs> get to our seats first. We're at the end of row seats and then wait, no, we've got to go all the way back down and out again. And it was most very, very awkward. Yeah. It was an amazing film though. I reckon. Yeah. In my uninformed opinion, I reckon this might be this generation's um, Lord of the Rings. In I the sense, so. in the sense that I don't think as someone who hasn't read the book, and you're you're very well informed on the subject, as is Shem. Um, from what I've heard from people, including yourself, that this is a pretty damn faithful adaptation and a great conversion to the big screen. In my view, it is so faithful that they've even done things in this film that would set them up if they wanted to go three or four books deep, if yeah. not more. There is so much like. There are so many little details in this film that as someone who's read the entire saga, I'm like, I know exactly why, for example, they dressed Baron Harkonnen in this very specific way because it foreshadows something that happens to another character way further down the line that they may never even put into the films if they don't get to do that many films. So I know for a fact that Villeneuve has like seriously researched his subject matter or at least has incredibly informed people working with him. And... As someone who I went in with incredibly low expectations. Oh, really? Because yeah. I hated Blade Runner twenty forty nine. Yeah. And he did another film. Um, oh, fucking hell, what was it called? Arrival. No, I love Arrival. Prisoners. And it was it was like some blue Valerian. bug Valerian. I fucking hate okay. Valerian. I loved how it looked. It was an awful film. I really thought he'd cast like wooden actors again, but he hadn't. The casting was also fantastic, and I was so so happy with this film. Yeah, I think Timothy Chalamet was amazing. Yeah. There's that picture of him reading June on on, on, like, the on on the ground like like four years ago. Or yeah. something. I thought that was super cool. It's so cool. Um, go give a shout out to my my man Dave Bautista. Yes. Bautista. Bautista. He is uh, probably I think the best wrestler turned actor. I think he's kind of left the other ones in the dust a bit because I'm not being funny. As I was saying the other day as well, Dwayne the Rock Johnson, nice as he is, he's not a good actor. Nope. And John Cena could go fuck himself. I despise that <laughs> man. So, but I will, I will not get into that. <laughs> so, you know, one character, um, you probably had no idea about this, but Leah Kynes, this character I'm showing on the screen here. Oh, yeah. She, in the books, is a man. Okay. And a lot of people lost their fucking minds um, when she was cast as a woman, but it doesn't matter. She did a fantastic job, I think, of um, Leah Kynes, who's a really, really interesting character. Um, and I think now we should specify from this point forwards, there are spoilers. Like major, major fucking spoilers. Not just for the films, this film or the David Lynch film, but for the entire saga. So if you care, let it be said that um, if you're not going to listen further, just go and fucking watch Dune. It's genuinely amazing. I haven't been to cinema in 10 years. Um, but I went to see this and I do not regret it because I actually hate the cinema. I hate sitting down for more than like an hour. I can barely watch like one episode of a TV series, but I was glued to my seat for the entire thing. And the two and a half hours went like 10 seconds and the whole time my mouth was open and I was smiling like a stupid person. And please go and do this. If you like sci-fi, you will not regret it. Yeah, I would say it is an objectively great film. Yeah. I, I cannot accept anybody who would have serious concerns and criticisms about that movie. I just can't see how you wouldn't like it. Um, Maybe more jokes. 
I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there, was that I don't know. there was that stupid fucking guy that wrote an article where he was <laughs> like, June is the most humorless film I've ever seen. There's one joke in the first 15 minutes. Then you've got to gird yourself because there's a single drop of humor. It's like, mate, why does every film have to be funny? Do you want to watch like a film about the Holocaust and have some jokes in it? Like, what do you, what are you expecting here? It's Dune. It's one of the most influential and wide spanning science fiction fantasy dramas ever fucking written it's like one of the most influential texts that like really took the world building of tolkien and properly did the job like there is so much that people don't even like i'm sure like there are people who know but there is so much that is to be discovered and delved into if this this series of films is allowed to continue that like Shut the fuck up, man. <laughs> Just watch the films and enjoy it. And like, if you want some jokes, go watch some MCU <laughs> and like stay for the post credit scene because that's another complaint that I've seen about this movie that there's no post credit scene and apparently that makes yeah. it awful. The other complaint was as well, people were like, because advertised on the posters, it's it's um, advertises uh, just June. Mm-hmm. But on the, um, when the movie starts, when the, the title screen rolls up, it says June part one. And people were like, oh, what? It's going to be more than one film? Oh, what a shame that they're then, expanding on these films. And some people some people were literally saying, because I, I like looking on Twitter just to piss myself off more than <laughs> I anything. I know exactly what you mean. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just like, um, and the people were saying that they felt shortchanged by the fact that it had an abrupt ending and they didn't feel like it concluded. It- it was a good enough conclusion. I was like, but I, I mean, I've never read the fucking books. And even I know that this is a fucking, a sprawling fucking universe and legendarium. Yeah. And there's no possible way you can cover it in one film. The entire, okay, so here's a spoiler that's kind of not a complete spoiler. The entire premise of the Dune saga is that history repeats itself through cycles that last centuries and millennia. Yeah. And that is, that is the plot of Dune. The plot of Dune is time is fucking huge. And yet somehow, regardless of whether you're fighting for good, you will eventually become awful and then be toppled and the cycle will continue and it will never end. And it's messy and chaotic. And yet this is this is something that like people can control and people do so. And it's fascinating how you see it span across centuries and people manipulating the threads of time for this exact thing to happen. And then, and you know, it. I'm sorry, but yes, if you expect that to fit into a single two and a half hour film, then your expectations are possi- possibly too high considering the amount of work that goes into making a movie and fitting all that into a certain amount of time. I love how our review so far has just consisted of getting annoyed at people <laughs> that didn't like the movie. <laughs> yep. But, so... What do you think about the way they handled um, spice and like the concept of spice? Because mm. it seemed to me like it it, it it seemed to portray it in a way that was quite easy for a casual to understand why this was such a commodity in the universe. They did a great job in the in the Lynch movie as well. It starts with how it's so iconic. It starts with like um, you see the princess Irulan, who's the daughter of the emperor. She's actually describing how spice works and why there's like a crisis of the universe about it. And like the fact it's so scarce, um, there is a comparison to be made with the middle East and oil spice is essentially the same thing. And the way that the so-called natives, the Fremen of Arrakis are um, treated is very much analogous. And then the fact that like an outsider comes and liberates them again is very Middle East, very Lawrence of Arabia. It is hundred percent a critique of the white savior complex. And it is not actually the white savior complex because of what happens afterwards, because it is very much um, not necessarily a good thing that this happens. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. And I think there is there is actually still... They haven't explained everything about Spice to you yet. Yeah. There's a lot more um, that is hidden intentionally that won't come out for a while about how Spice works and how it's made and how exactly it can make you be able to do crazy cool things. Yeah. So it seemed to have quite a profound impact on the uh, on the main character. Yeah, he's he's um he's described as being susceptible to it. There is um I don't know I, I kind of feel bad ruining this for you because I kind of loved seeing you experiencing it for the first time. So I don't know how much I should tell ah, you. Just go for it. Fuck it. There is um so I haven't read the books in like a good six or seven years, but I do remember um there's so something Paul has to go to go through is to drink the water of life. 
Yeah. And the water of life basically is completely, it's like insanely poisonous. I yeah. think it's like ma mostly spice. Let me Google this because I don't want to get this wrong. Um, but there's like this ritual where he has to go through it. And once he has, he's like fully awakened. Um, and it's funny because in the Bible, they actually do refer to the bitter waters. Um, yeah. And this is essentially, I'm pretty sure, like a throwback to that stuff. Because a lot of this, the Fremen words and language is taken from um, Hebrew, Arabic. There are Persian words in it as well. A lot of like Islamic stuff. So again, 100% analogous to Middle East. It's a poisonous food liquid used by the Bene Gesserit to turn their sisters into reverend mothers. Yep. So to the untrained, in, um, and there's again lots of Buddhism, so in prana bindu body control, the substance is lethal. Even the smallest amount will kill someone in incredible agony. So Paul has to drink like a huge gourd of it. Yeah. Um, in this huge ritual, and it's like horrifically psychedelic, and you you genuinely don't know if he's going to survive. It's crazy. So would you say that scene where he's doing the test with the hand and with the Gonjabar, pain is, yeah. is that kind of like a, a prelude or maybe a, yeah. a kind of a, a sign of things to come of some of the trials and tribulations he's going to have to go through? The, the Gomjabar is, um, is basically how to, to differentiate between someone who is an animal and a person within the, within the saga. And it's like very historically significant to make sure that people who don't have, who have a lack of control aren't allowed into the order. Um, and like this, there is a huge war called the, um, oh fuck, it's got really, the Butlerian Jihad, I'm pretty sure it's called, um, where m men and machines basically like fight each other. And yeah. men use machines. And machines and computers are completely banned in the world of Dune, which is why you have the human computers called the Mentats. Yeah. Um, I've completely fucking forgotten where I'm going with this, but whatever I said before this is related to what I just said now. So do your own damn research. Right? Just, just what I just said. Connect it together. I've gone... Water of life, and then he brought up the Oh, Gomjabat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's really... It was important because you have you have people as well. Um, what are they fucking called? The face dancers. You've got face dancers, right? Who I think they're Tlilaxu. And they can change their faces and, like pretend to be other people so again it's another way of making sure it's not someone like if you're in that much agony it's making sure they're not not who they are oh okay Got as you. well so it's yeah. like a way of identifying someone as a person who's worthy of learning these like insanely dangerous powers and training and things that can like completely destroy you and destroy other people it's like giving someone the keys to a nuclear bomb basically oh cool so the character you were talking about before, so the one that you said was cast as a female, I've forgotten the name. Liat Kynes. So you said there was a bit of a reaction towards that. Mm. Liat Kynes is um, quite an important character because their death precipitates, I'm pretty sure, the civil war um, that actually makes the Fremen um, actively hostile towards the Harkonnen because they're basically like Fremen royalty, if I remember correctly. And they're also, they're the person who keeps the secret of Arrakis and is like a bridge between um, the emperor and the people of, uh, of Arrakis. Yeah. So like, yeah, the, being the ecologist is like really, really important because the dream of the Fremen is to make Dune into a green planet. Yeah. So that so that's why they were cultivating all those plants and stuff in the in the bunker part. Okay. That's why it's so holy as well. Those like palm trees in yeah. the films. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty wild. So how do you think it compared to the David Lynch one? Did you, you talk about how that is a favorite of yours as well. Mm. The Lynch one is one of my favorite movies ever. Um, I'm pretty sure seeing that as a little kid was like a very formative moment for me. Um, and I still love it. And I think if I l watch it again now, it will be different <laughs> for sure. Because <laughs> it is nowhere near as good. But it's wonderful. I mean, there's a pug in it. <laughs> um, there's the Atreides pug and like it's in multiple scenes that lucky little dog cute little thing um, and Sting wearing a fucking cod piece shaped like an eagle or whatever it is is so sick and the weird like disgusting s you haven't seen what the original Baron Harkonnen looks like oh, God, I want to see this oh he is so gross so Sting played um, no, he's, he's Raban in the one we just oh, okay, okay, okay yeah he's so disgusting and he's like kind of a paedophile as well 
he's gross and he like floats around in his little spice suit. <laughs> There's oh. a Trump meme of him. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they are essentially the same person. <laughs> but yeah, the, the actor who plays and does it so well, it's like a really visceral, um, like, oh God, yeah. gluttonous guy. But I think that um, Skarsgård did an incredible job of the heart of the Baron and did like, Probably definitely a better performance, unfortunately. See, I see, I completely forgot it was Stellan Skarsgård, even though I knew it was he him. was in it going into it. I completely forgot. It kind of reminded me a bit of the engineers from Prometheus. I remember saying yeah, that at the time. Yeah, yeah. Had like a similar kind of look to them, and I think it's quite, it's quite a cold, like really like remorseless type of looking. I think Batista fits perfectly for that as well because he's naturally a very muscular person. Yeah, um, that's who originally played his character in the Lynch film. Ah. Who have orange hair that cuts them all as gingers? <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> I don't know what that means? <laughs> but yeah, I think that Skarsgård did a. F oh my god, he's like genuinely chilling. Yeah. Just yeah, no, it was. Um, I think one thing that has to be said for this movie um, is I thought that the Hans Zimmer score was fantastic. It's the first time I've actually not detested a Hans Zimmer score. It's very fucking good. Yeah. The Mongolian throat singing for the Sada car. Yeah, that was cool. <laughs> and like the composer with his like weird hand movements. Yeah. And they have fucking microtonal bagpipes. That was really cool. That was like proper like euphoric. Yeah. It's like that meme I <laughs> posted. Like your music <laughs> <Yes>! saved me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I loved it. That made me so happy. You know, I think it's really interesting how the Atreides have the um the bagpipes. Because it's kind of like a Scottish um association yeah and i would like obviously not in the books because that that doesn't exist in the universe of dune but that's what definitely for us the viewer in that like these atreides are like portrayed very much as liberators because they are in the short term they do a fantastic job of like not being like the harkonnens and trying to build like a connection with the fremen of arrakis um and so you have this like very music associated with people who've been oppressed themselves yeah, um, yeah. and who fought for their freedom. And that's kind of what happens to Paul along the way. Um, but then, yeah, you've got like the ominous fucking throat singing of the Sadaka. Yeah. That juxtaposes that as well. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Yeah. It's, I'm surprised you don't like any of uh, other of uh, Hans Zimmer's scores. You're not, not a fan normally. Um, I don't mind the Pirates of the Caribbean one. That was him, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, was, that was Hans Zimmer. The thing with Hans Zimmer is that his music is incredibly repetitive, which I get it, it's film music. But I also think that he he basically, act, he's admitted to recycling his own film scores. So the film, the score for Pirates of the Caribbean, for example, was actually taken from one of his earlier films in the 90s. Oh, okay. I can't remember oh. what it's called. It's like some airplane film or some shit, I think. And it's exactly the same. He just hasn't even bothered to write new music. He's just like taken the same theme. It's like literally writing like 10 albums using a single riff. That's what Hans Zimmer does. Yeah. And I know he writes really catchy, like pop music style um, film scores. And some of them, yes, are incredibly iconic. But I just think he's shit. Um, and I just don't like how unoriginal his work is. I think he could do better. I it feels lazy that you're being paid that much money that another composer would put so much more effort into and you're being that lazy with your own music. Yeah. Sorry, Hans Zimmer. Yeah, no, uh, yeah I mean, in a way, uh, maybe he's just thinking, ah, well, you know. They won't notice. People, people love what I do because so I'll just recycle it and then easy for me, easy money, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, all the producers oh. are just like, just do what you did with the other film, and he just keeps doing it over and over again. I'm I was so shocked by that fucking Danny Elfman album. It was so fucking good. Man. It was amazing. It was like Imagine so if he did the Dune yeah. soundtrack. Yeah. That would have yeah. been wild. But I wonder who, if Villeneuve had more influence or impact on what Zimmer wrote for this film and was like, no, I want you to do this like that, because everything felt super thought out. Yeah, he's he, he seems quite... I, I am a big fan of a lot of his films. Like uh, Sicario, which I watched kind of recently, I thought was fucking amazing. Cool. Um, I'm a big fan of like super, super gritty kind of crime based and drug and cartel, all that sort of stuff. Because I think it's, and oftentimes it's done in a way that is really uh, kind of glorifying that lifestyle, which I don't like. Yeah, but I this that. this film doesn't. So it portrays just how horrific it is. And it's like, it's quite a fucked up film, but I really, really enjoyed it. Nice. Um, and I thought Arrival was a pretty good sci-fi film. I enjoyed that. It was a fantastic sci-fi film. Yeah. Yeah, that was really good. Um, yeah, I think this this film is going to set um, definitely set a bar. This is going to be one of those films where the next 10, sci like the next 10 years of sci-fi is going to somehow try and copy everything in this film. So we're going to see a lot more like 
hopefully really heavy bass heavy soundtracks because like normally whenever i watch a film trailer they use that sub bass they use it way too much yeah Yeah, Yeah. but like they actually used it really well even though they used it so much yeah it was i think that's another kind of like criticism people have had sometimes they think the score overpowers some of the dialogue Ah. i mean i i heard everything pretty much more or less i think it was fine um and also like the music um the voice is so important in the books like in the weirding way which is like kind of part of the fight fighting that happens the the way you use your voice is really important so you can use your voice to cut things and hurt people and damage and attack yeah um and it's the same with the Bene Gesserit like they use the voice um where they can like make people do what they tell them to do if they use their voice in a particular way so it kind of I think it's supposed to be overpowering because acoustics are like part of how people manipulate the fabric of things and spice as well it lets you fold the fabric of time and space so yeah. why not you uh, why not be able to do that with literally music and your voice and things like that one thing i was wondering like the whole thing with like the voice and stuff because it really reminds me of the power that the main character has in preacher i don't know if you've ever oh, seen oh yeah i love preacher, watched preacher. Yeah. the graphic novel is amazing yeah. i love it it's so good so like he's possessed by a spirit called genesis which is like a, an angel and, and a demon making love and it creates this thing that can you know destroy the entire world and um one thing i was wondering was so the power of the voice they have in dune is that derived from some sort of celestial or angelical spirit or no and I... is there because obviously in tokyo you've got eru Iluvatar, who's like the one god do they get into like theology at all in the dune universe so if the theology of the dune universe is all seeded and it's all propaganda seeded by the bene Gesserit. ah okay so i think the voice is actually science i think it's a manipulation of the air and like a psychological trick i think it's less religious yeah. and actually religion is is a framework that's used to control people and a framework which is like very intricately manipulated through hundreds and thousands of years by different by the Bene Gesserit essentially yeah. who will, like when they say to um, Jessica we've prepared the way for you that is about the religion that they've planted there so when Jessica for example is talking to um, shout out Mapes in yeah. the in like when in their compound and she's showing her the sword for example and she's like it is a maker she doesn't know what she's saying she doesn't know how it's going to affect shout out mapes because she doesn't actually know what she's talking about yeah she's yeah. just saying the words that she knows the bene Gesserit will have planted there to go with whatever it is that they associate with those words the symbols they associate so to, to them it's the tooth of the worm yeah. she doesn't know until <laughs> until like it's it's presented to her in these particular secrets which is why she signs there might be violence to the guard behind her because you don't actually know she doesn't know how it's going to play out okay okay that's why she's freaking out like most of the time okay and it's really funny because preparing the way is a biblical term um so in the bible in the old testament when um the the presence of john the baptist he is described as preparing the way for christ so he literally says it's like right at the end of the old testament i will prepare the way i'm pretty sure he says something like that so a lot of that is actually even that language is um, foreshadowing the arrival of the Messiah, which is yeah. how Paul is treated. Yeah. And I'm guessing there's some next level shit that goes down in regards to that. Because I've, I've heard that like things go from like zero to a hundred. And like part two is going to be pretty fucking like very quite action. There's going to be well. so yeah. much action, yeah. a huge amount of action. Definitely. There's some, a lot of, and the, the thing that they don't um, go into yet, I, I don't know if they even will bother talking about it, but you see a las gun being used yeah. um, to like when they attack, when the Harkonnens attack the Atreides and las guns are illegal because they're like literally lasers that can just slice through anything. So yeah. like you see them when um, Duncan Idaho is trying to escape, you see them like slicing through all this stuff. And that's like a major no, no. Yeah. Um, and the introduction of las guns makes for insanely brutal fight scenes i can imagine i mean that's i mean you could just fucking cut anything in, with that right yeah if you yeah. if you aim one at a human it's like damn son <laughs> to quote kevin hart damn <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And to quote uh, kevin hart i'm sorry yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh it doesn't don't do the lasers disrupt the shields in some horrific way probably something like that yeah 
Yeah, and the shields, like, they're interesting because they make the sandworms go fucking mental. So it's, um, in, uh, I think the way they done the sandworms was amazing. Yeah. And it's like, I found out recently I've got thalassophobia. Oh, yeah, you know, like just like water. fear of like deep water. And there's like a couple of scenes in that movie where like, oh, yeah, the sandworms is this massive, like, fucking like 300 meter diameter mouth. And I'm just like, that is fucking terrifying. <laughs> like, it's super cool. But it's um, so one thing I kind of picked up on was that the Fremen were kind of talking about the worms or the, the Shai Halud as, as kind of being like a deity. Do they see them as like some form of gods then? Or? Yeah, they no. do. Uh, again, this is going to be a major spoiler. I don't. I don't. Should I even say it? You say it ah, fuck it. Why not? Okay. We'll do it live. So, eventually, Paul. So Paul is the Kwisatch Haderach, which means yeah. that he can bend time and space, and he has these insane omni- omni- omnipotent powers. Yeah. So Shai Halud in the legends of the fremen and like i might get a few details wrong here so i'm sorry because it has been a while i should i didn't have much time i didn't do any research i'm just remembering stuff from years ago but he um so shai hulud the all the worms are referred to as a single god all the worms are shai hulud and paul becomes a worm oh shit paul becomes he literally turns into a sandworm yeah because the sandworms um produce spice yeah um, and they are essentially the secret to how Arrakis works. Now, Paul turns, um, he starts turning Arrakis into like um, a paradise. But obviously this erodes the desert and this affects spice production to an extent. If I remember correctly, I might be remembering it wrong. But Paul literally does turn into a sandworm. And he, there are the, he's like, he becomes this horrific fascist dictator, basically. Yeah. He kills... Isn't it his son, Leto? Is it his son that turns Leto, into the worm? Leto Atreides 2 turns into... I thought he is Leto Atreides 2. His dad is Leto Atreides 1, no? Let me... Oh, my God. Because oh, he's Paul Atreides. I thought... Oh. The second son of Paul Atreides. Oh, I'm so fucking yeah. stupid. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So his son turns into the god worm. Oh, because, yeah, he goes against his own son. He becomes the heretic. Yeah, because he, uh, so he basically, Paul precipitates this, uh, a jihad. He literally starts a jihad. Yeah. And everyone dies and fights each other. And like the Fremen are basically almost extinct. Everything is fucking horrible. I think like <laughs> mi- tens of millions of people die because of Paul. Yeah. And he hates it. He doesn't, he literally doesn't want any of it to happen, but he feels like he can't. Like this is uh, like a free will fate kind of thing. And he just goes down this road um, because he feels like he has to make those choices at a time. And then, yeah, he has um, his son becomes this like horrific God emperor dictator who is a fucking sandworm. Yeah. Um, and like that's what that cover of that book was where you see the face at the head of the worm. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And eventually he just goes off into the fucking desert and becomes mm. a sandworm. And all the sandworms are him on Dune. His yeah. consciousness and mind is present within every single sandworm. So Damn. the legend of the gods being Shai Hulud is actually about the future. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Jeez, that's so in tough. future, the god, the worms are gods. Man, if I, if I smoked weed, I'd be so freaked out by now, man. <laughs> You'd be like, like, whoa, whoa, man. Whoa, man. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. It's so cool because basically, um, Lito too, he like, there's like baby, the baby sandworms are like these cute little fish things sand trout and they like kind of swim around in these like little yeah. little mini like canats i think they're called yeah. um which is funny because that's an arabic word for um a canal that they use for irrigation in the desert yeah. and they're like really important to like the birth of civilization the iranians are the first ones anyway so he like sees the sand trout and he like puts his arm into the canat and they start like crawling up his arm yeah and then like fuse with his flesh Oh. And that's how the transformation begins. Okay. And it's like really freaky because he's like slowly just turning into a worm throughout yeah. the entire book. And basically his like Paul um, becomes blind. So he literally becomes the crazy blind prophet, which is super biblical. Yeah, Wanders yeah, around yeah. the desert and eventually comes back into the city and tries to overthrow his son. Damn. <laughs> it's, so cool. it's so good. That's mental. Yeah. I need to read these damn books. <laughs> They're so good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The detail and the descriptions are wonderful. And there is so, so much shout out to Eastern religion and mysticism that I genuinely appreciate because they're not being appropriated. They're kind of being used as an example of how colonialization works, which is 
colonization works, which is really interesting because you know they've been planted there by the Bene Gesserit to manipulate the Fremen. So it's not appropriation in the, oh, look, these words are cool way. It's appropriation in the, oh, God, these people have been brainwashed into believing that this is what holiness is. Yeah, and then it's used yeah. to control them and to like make them feel these strong feelings and to feel that their culture is theirs but it's not their culture is actually in some ways been forced on them and it's really yeah. it's not anti-islamic um it's actually more anti-christian because yeah. this is like very much the atreides and the harkonnens are white and they are courty they are court class um families who are being manipulated by the emperor like this whole thing is very much like like the political maneuverings of for example france versus russia and iran and yeah. then like england coming in and fucking like you know arrakis is the victim of the harkonnens and the atreides and the bene Gesserit and the tlilaxu and yeah. the spacing guild and like the emperor and yeah. all that stuff yeah i mean and that's like i'm not being funny but like how fucked up is the situation in like say iraq and yeah and it's for the same reasons yeah yeah it's really interesting that these that you can see these parallels in this like vast um, cosmic drama that plays out. And, you know, like the, for example, like the revolutionaries becoming the the dictators in the end, like that's something that we've seen countless times in the past hundred years alone. It's yeah. really interesting that you can see that being played out. Yeah. Weren't you saying that the Harkonnens were originally good? Okay, so I haven't read these books for literally a decade, but I vaguely remember. So the um, so Frank Herbert wrote the Dune saga, and then his son, who's kind of a bit of a shithead, no offense, but well, offense, um, <laughs> Brian Herbert, who's like doesn't fucking understand what Dune is about, wrote these awful, awful prequel books that are about the um, but Lyrian Jihad. Jihad. So you've literally got these like fucking guys in mecha transformer space shoot suits with names like Agamemnon fighting in space yeah. um, and they're having like, these insane like last gun battles with each other and like I think somehow they get reborn and things like that I can't remember but yeah I think Agamemnon is an Atreides but basically the bad guy the really really horrifically awful bad guy I'm pretty sure is an Atreides yeah. and they're actually like a fucking awful family <laughs> and they're really evil so I think it's like another kind of flip of the cycle okay. um, but yeah. I could again be remembering it wrong please someone correct me if I'm wrong I will reread these books soon Ironically, I'd have done a much better job of this six months down the line, but we're so excited about it right now. It's just really fun to talk about. Yeah. yeah. It's like such a... It does really remind me of Tolkien, just how expansive the universe is it's in so terms of... like, Because I remember you telling me that apparently the books span thousands of years. They do, yeah. Yeah, which is just wild. Um, it's, so how, how, how far do you reckon the movie's going to go? I mean, we're going to get a part two, I presume in 2023 which i think everyone is like super hyped for because yeah. um i just wonder if they'll go any further than that so part two will be only the end of the first book and yeah. there are six books that i'm pretty sure let me let me double check there's a lot of books um and yeah i don't they could easily do like a spin-off on just the Bene Gesserit. Yeah. they could easily do that on like the sauda car for example i suppose it depends on the like the commercial success in the movies i suppose you know i mean mm. it's gonna have to wait and see yeah i'm pretty sure there are six it says dune dune messiah children of dune god emperor of dune heretics of dune chapter house dune hunters of dune is that oh that's so they okay that's going to be brian herbert and kevin anderson so the first six are like the actual proper books um and then sandworms of dune and sands of dune and then i'm pretty sure brian did a bunch of like bullshit fucking butler and jihad stuff but these are all oh my god they're fantastic yeah i'd definitely give them a read at some point the old covers are so good as well they've got like fantastically weird janky sci-fi covers on them so they're worth checking out i love the i love old sci-fi pulpy like weird covers with yeah. like the bright primary colors and stuff they're fantastic yeah no i was just super i uh, probably it was my favorite cinema experience of the last kind of definitely five to ten years anyway for me, it's the best since Lord of the Rings. I'm not even exaggerating. Did you watch Lord of the Rings when it came out in the cinema? Yeah, that was great. That was, that was fucking mind blowing. Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, it was mind blowing. What was your What was your like other movie that? God, you know the, the crazy thing is, I've never been that big a film person. Like, I'm very much quite strange in the way I consume media. 
Like, and I've always been more focused on listening to music and stuff. And because I've always been so obsessed with music, I find it hard to focus on more than one type of media. Mm. It's only really recently, I'd say in the last maybe five to maybe 10 years at a stretch that I've started watching TV shows and stuff and following like things with a lot of seasons and stuff. Like I've obviously I've said many times how much I love The Wire. And, and you're um, going to say The Wire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, my partner's rewatching Walking Dead at the moment, which is interesting to see that again because it was just because i had frank darabon direct the first two seasons and i love him he's a great director he directed the green mile and shawshank redemption um and also the mist as well so all, all stephen king short stories I'm not sure if they're all short stories but i know definitely um the green mile and shawshank were i'm sorry but look at that calvin klein advert <laughs> <laughs> looks like a softcore porno yeah that was a bit <laughs> It's like he's just sent me. Oh, I'm sorry. It's like the shop front in some of those Soho shops, isn't it? <laughs> it's really disturbing. Um, Cal, I feel like this guy's just like sent me an unsolicited picture of himself in underwear. It's so creepy. It's like a bathroom selfie. Yeah, that's that's a bit wild. Okay, I'm sorry. That was very not fun for people to listen to, but it was a genuinely disconcerting. Yeah. Calvin Klein underwear advert. I'm very sorry, everybody. I'm trying to think. Has there been any real? No, nah, there's never really been. Lord of the Rings was probably the big one for me because I was a fan of the books before I went to watch the films. Same, yeah. And I felt like the movies actually helped clarify a few things in the book for me, helped me visualize a few things anyway. Lothlorien. Lothlorien, uh, Theoden's Possession. I had no idea ah. what the fuck was going on in the book. I was you like, know what that's from? That is word for word from the Hall of the Mountain King in um, Beowulf. Oh, shit, it is, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. God. I did that at uni. It was so fun. What the weird thing was, I I was read Beowulf in primary school. I was like way beyond <laughs> any of us. That's a crazy thing to read in <laughs> yeah. primary school. Did they show you the film of like naked Angelina Jolie as well? Nah, it would have been way before that. <laughs> Obviously, it was, um, yeah, this would have been in the early mid 90s. But um, yeah, because there was a teacher, Miss Burden, her name was, she read this to The Hobbit. Because our lessons would consist of, we'd do like, um, I mean, it would be like maths, English, and then at the end of the day, there'd always be like 40 minutes where she would just read to us. That's really nice. And she would just sit, sit down and, and she would read us The Hobbit and then she read us Beowulf and um, a couple other books. I can't remember which ones though, but it was always just so cool because like when you're that young, because you, I would have been maybe year three or four, so maybe like seven or eight. So I'm just like, I was grasping some bits and I really liked this idea of these fictional worlds that were so expansive, but didn't quite have the like, maturity to fully like understand everything mm. but it was enough to make me want to read it yeah like, oh, like so i remember i went to my mom after she read us the hobbit i was and my mom had a few copies of lord of the rings she was just like oh can i have them i want to read them i want to read them mm. and i read them and i was like super super like way too young like nine ten and i was just like and i got like most of it and then then the films came out and i read them again and it was just like okay yeah, everything makes complete sense to me now I think I read this somewhere really, you know, when I was like eight or nine years old. <laughs> yes. And I was reading Lord of yeah. the Rings and Hobbit when I was like, I had a, I was a really freaky, weird child. I was reading like War and Peace at 10 and stuff like nice. that. So I read them really young and I really loved them. And yeah, the films were, I just really wanted to be an elf when I was a kid. Yeah. I wanted to be like a tall, graceful, pale elf, which is very problematic thinking back on it. <laughs> um, and I used to go on like message boards on the internet and go on role play boards and pretend I was a dark elf. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's went, actually it's oddly sweet i went into an inn and they were like we won't serve you because you're a dark elf wow <laughs> so stupid jesus <laughs> dark elf racist um yeah whatever don't serve your kind here <laughs> <laughs> it's um oh god what was i gonna say i lost my train of thought i'm sorry but <laughs> just that's so funny <laughs> It's just so stupid. <laughs> Elf hate crime. Nah. <laughs> it's um. I remember like thinking the elves were dicks in Lord of the Rings. Like, they kind of are. Yeah, but then I think once you read the Silmarillion, you're kind of like, ah, but they, they have been for a lot of shit. Oh like, man, the crossing of the it was it? I can't pronounce the it. Helicarax. Helicarax. Yeah. yeah, that is so trauma. I remember being so traumatized. Yeah. And then like uh, Neonor as well, and like Hurin, and oh man, it's just. It, everyone dies in the most depressing way. Nothing yeah. gets resolved the way it should. The Silmarils are all just like... But I kind of feel bad for Morgoth um, when like he gets seduced and then she's like, <laughs> lied, sorry, bye. <laughs> 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 it gets cucked. Yeah. Huh? This is going to be about you. Uh, this is also... This is relevant <laughs> to Dune. <laughs> it's, it's world building fantasy. It is relevant. I'm sure Dune fans also like Lord of the Rings. I'd be hard pressed to find one that doesn't. <laughs> but Shem, do you not like Lord of the Rings? 
You don't like Lord of the Rings? There you go. For fuck's sake. <laughs> He's found the one button he can press with me. It's like the one thing you might actually be able to troll me on. God damn. That's such a hot take. Looked like I was getting ready to square up there, didn't it? I just <laughs> yeah, smiled for a second. I was like, fuck him out. <laughs> but nah, it's... Um, no, but I, I'm just going to reiterate one more time just about this film to conclude. It was fucking amazing. You should go watch it. The cinematography, yep. the acting... Yep. The score, the set pieces. I don't know if they were using miniatures for some of the shots. Cause... Or like matte paintings and things. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it was just like the the portrayal of like interstellar space travel and just the scope oh, and how, how grandiose everything was was just yeah. stunning. I've never seen something because sometimes you watch something that's like space or cosmic based and it's like it can sometimes be a bit hard to suspend disbelief, especially with I've actually never seen the Star Wars films. But from the clips I've seen, like, you it's know. It's nothing compared to that. Yeah, it's, like, yeah. not aged well. And, like, even even a movie like like Interstellar, I felt, like, touched a few of the right buttons in terms of how the cinematography and how they portrayed space travel. But I just thought the film was kind of shit, to be honest. And it was just really depressing. But this I liked, and I thought that it was fine without humor, personally. Have despite you seen, what everyone else thinks. Have you seen... As in two- that one guy. <laughs> Have you seen 2001 A Space Odyssey? That's great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think if you like that film, you like this. The silences in this film are used really well. So like you can't hear in space. So when the ships are coming through, you can't hear them. And that makes it feel even more vast than any music could have possibly portrayed in that moment. Definitely. One bit I really liked in this film was when the... Oh, I forgot to pronounce it. The Bene... Bene Gesserit or Gesserit or whatever. Bene it Gesserit. doesn't really matter. When they um, were on their way to um, to to test Paul and they were, they were coming out of their ship and it was like raining. Yeah, and, it was and they're just, flapping the, around. Yeah, it was just such a cool visual, I thought. Yeah. And it's um, and even when... Um, I've forgotten the name of the Paul's mum. Jessica. Jessica, thank you. When she was like first, when they first arrived on Arrakis, and she was like walking in her, like she was like all flowing and stuff as well. Yeah. I thought it was quite a cool visual. There's just loads. It's just a beautiful film. I really love. Um, well, this I think they've not included the right things. So, for example, in the Dune universe, you have something called a chair dog, yeah. which is literally a dog that's been bred to be a chair, and they're alive. And like, they, if you kick them, they'll whimper and they'll like move around to shift to your body, which yeah. would have been horrific to see on screen. I think. Yeah, that would be... I don't think that would have translated well to film. No, I think also executing that would have been utterly horrific. But that weird spider thing was quite cool, though. We were talking about that a bit earlier, weren't we? Yeah, Yeah. that that was intriguing. That is not book canon, but I appreciate it. I like the spider. Yeah. Yeah. I like how it whimpers and scuttles away when uh, the voice is used on it. But I think it's um, Helena Mohame, the like head of the Gesserit Order, when she uses her voice on it. There's just... Oh, I must mention... So I've not actually said this on the podcast yet. So um, I'm sure many people who are actually listening this far know that originally Jodorowsky, Alejandro Jodorowsky, was going to make the Dune films in like the 70s. And that Dune film fell apart for uh, many, many reasons. Mainly because Jodorowsky is insane. (laughs) (laughs) Wasn't the budget like... It was ridiculous. hundreds of millions. Yeah. Like Salvador Dali was meant to be in it and... Dali was charging like $500,000 an hour or something like that. Um, yeah, Mick Jagger was going to be in it. HR Jiger? Uh, <laughs> what? It's because I said Mitch, Mick Jagger. And he said Jig Jagger. Jake Jagger. <laughs> Jake Jagger. <laughs> What's wrong with me? Um, I've had too much food. HR Geiger was hired to do some of the artwork, as was Moebius. Um, so Mo- Moebius did the spaceships and all the costuming. The original costumes for this one would have been wild. And Geiger did, well, Giga did a lot of the concepts which were used in this modern Dune film by Villeneuve. So you can actually see, for example, G.D. Prime is very much taken from Geiger's original concept for G.D. Prime. If you, if you don't believe me, go Google it. It's literally almost exactly the same. Um, and then also there were like little details and bits that were very much Geiger. And I absolutely loved that Villeneuve wasn't like being insecure and like not wanting to throw back to it. The Lynch, um, the Lynch Dune film as well has some Geiger, but interestingly, if the Jodorowsky film had never been made, then Geiger would never have met Ridley Scott. So, um, because the film, the original film failed, Geiger met Ridley Scott, and Alien was born. So, we would never have had Alien if that film had never failed, and I think that's kind of awesome. Yeah, because you, you you can't imagine how different the film landscape would be without the Alien franchise, because like and metal. Yeah. Imagine Celtic Frost 
and Triptychon, all these bands, all these album covers without Geiger. Yeah. We would never <gasps> have known him. Yeah. Oh, I'm really annoyed. I can't remember this. There's like a thrash death metal band that used a, a, a Giger cover. <laughs> and um, I forgot their fucking name, but it's a really good album and it's going to piss me off and I'll remember it later. So I'm not going to... Shem's going to find it and then we'll just randomly scream it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, he's just so iconic. And yeah, the failure of Dune allowed him to blossom and allowed so much culture to come out of it. And there's an incredible documentary about the failure of that Dune film, which has some really problematic moments in it. Jodorowsky, <laughs> as much as I love his films, I love Holy Mountain, I love to El Topo. I really liked um, his autobiographical Dead film. Kennedy's. Dead Kennedy's? Dead Kennedy's had an album called Franken Christ. Okay. That used a um, very sexual artwork. <laughs> Giga. Giga was very horny. Yeah, it wasn't Dead Kennedy's. It was some... I don't think these guys were given, like, because I, I know Giga would give um, uh, permission. Oh, yeah, he's a, he does the magma. And he designed um, Jonathan Davis's mic stand for corn. Right? Oh, yeah. Like, that was actually a commission piece from him, right? If I'm not mistaken. Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. No yeah. way. So yeah. many bands that we've covered on the podcast this year have Giga. Oh, obviously, Heartwork, Carcass, Carcass. of course. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Was it a, a, yeah, it was atrocity. Yeah. yeah, that's what it was. Sick. Can't remember. Sick. That's a great album cover as well. Suffocation, the Effigy of the Forgotten. Yeah, yeah, that magma. That's like a proper baby Geiger thing. Oh my god. Yeah, he. So unfortunately, Jodorowsky in this documentary says that um, Jodorowsky was not planning in any way, shape, or form to be loyal to the books, and unfortunately, he uses a very problematic comparison. He says that he wanted to rape the books in the same way that you would rape a woman you're attracted to. And we do not stand by that statement <laughs> at all. I think it's fucking stupid and disgusting that he said that, and it's gross. And no matter how old you are, don't fucking... Don't do that. That is, There are so many other ways you can make a beautiful metaphor, and that is not a beautiful metaphor. It's a stupid way of describing art. Um, so yeah, that's the caveat on Jodorowsky. However, we do love the crazy, crazy ass shit that he's done. And it has actually low-key influenced a lot of insane cinema. And I feel Vill Villeneuve has taken that influence and also the influence from the Lynch film because Lynch hated his film so much that he, he refused to have his name on it. Yeah. yeah. I, I heard that he, one of his like pseudonyms was, uh, it was like some, Judas something or something Judas. And oh, like yeah. the Judas was the reference to the studio for fucking them over. Oh my God. That would make sense. That would make sense. Yeah, he like properly disowned it. It is really one of my favorite films. Like I, I love it. I love how weird like the Benny Gesserit look where these like bald, cr crazy looking women with like cool outfits who they really like big up, beef up the power and like the intensity the, of the Benny Gesserit in a way that like as much as I think um, Lady Jessica is portrayed really well in the Villeneuve film. Yeah. I prefer the Lady Jessica of the Lynch film. Maybe I'll watch it again and I won't feel that way. Yeah. But she's so much more strong. And I feel like in the books, she's much stronger until much later on where she does start to break down a little bit. But I get why she is like freaking out and crying and stuff. It's just strange because the Bene Gesserit training is so intense. I don't, Im I don't feel like she would be reacting that strongly Yeah. in those situations. Also, there's a Children of Dune TV miniseries I think came out around 2000 and Susan Sarandon is Lady Jessica in it and it's so weird to see her as a Benny Gesserit. Yeah. It's, um, I think the concept of them seems quite cool because, I mean, like, let's be honest, how many films, even now to this day, still have female characters portrayed as just nothing other than love interests? I know. And it's like, I can't remember the name of the test. What's the test that films have to uh, pass? Bechdel test. That's it, yeah. Yeah. So interestingly, um, in the next few weeks, the Wheel of Time TV series is coming out. And oh. there is an order of women in the Wheel of Time that are 100% in, um, um, influenced by the Bene Gesserit. Oh, okay. Cool. And they are called the Aes Sedai. And they are like, they access like a female specific magical power and men who access it like go insane yeah and it's kind of like similar ish to the dune thing not that they go insane because the male half is tainted it's a very long story and it's like fifteen thousand pages of lore but um yeah that is gonna be really interesting too because the women are so cool and interesting in it that'd be cool It'd be interesting to see you taking that because you've just recently finished the book series right so yeah i did 
I don't care if they do a bad job. I'm just happy they're doing it because it will get more people interested in science fiction and fantasy. And I think Dune as well is going to hopefully just, as you say, influence a whole new generation of people to be delving into like something that is so wonderful. Like science fiction and fantasy is for people who also like with metal are marginalized and who don't feel like they fit in. And yeah. it's, it is about like the intricacies of social standing and status and power and history and movement, which is something we all like. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah and I think it's kind of like breaking down a few kind of maybe prejudices about that certain genre, like much in the same way, you know, metal has a lot to offer to music fans in general. Yeah. I think people sometimes don't realize how complex some of those compositions are. I think the same could be said about sci-fi. Like I think Absolutely. a common perception of sci-fi, ah, it's for nerds, for you know, like geeky people. I don't think people quite realize how deep it, uh, a lot of the subject matter is mm -hmm. in a lot of the source material. So. I think it's also the other way around too. I think some people don't want to share it with other people. I think they want it to be only for them. Like a gatekeeper kind of mentality. Yeah. But yeah. I think, you know, it's only a good thing if more people know about it and enjoy it because that means more of it will be created and more of it will be funded. And we'll have even more cool stuff like Dune. Like, imagine what the next Wheel of Time is going to be. Imagine what the next Dune is going to be. I can't fucking wait. Like, this is, this is like the Black Sabbath of science fiction. Yeah. And that means that one day we're going to have a sleep and one day we'll have an electric wizard and one day we'll have a death. Yeah. And I can't, like, I want to be around. I want this to be popular enough that we're alive to see that happen. Yeah. I hope it is because I'm not being funny. Like, you know, I'm not a massive fan of the Marvel franchise, but like that review is kind of indicative of kind of what is wrong with like, a lot of people's attention span when it comes yeah. to movies. It's just like, yeah. oh, well, there's no pop culture references or there's no post credit scene. And like, I don't want to lay the blame squarely at Marvel's feet for that, but like at the no, same... I think we should. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, imagine if Duncan... I was trying to be diplomatic. <laughs> <laughs> if Duncan Idaho just makes a random reference to Twitter yeah. and the Dune yeah. universe. Yeah. Like... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, fuck that, man. <laughs> like Paul, we're out of Sugon sauce. It's like, <laughs> You're just like ripping more randomly nuts. up here. <laughs> God. But no, I, I think it's... Um, I can't remember what part of, Oh, I've got in my head now is how much Marvel films piss me off. So I'll just leave it there. <laughs> Fair enough, man. So yeah, like, um, like a Duncan Idaho living a thousand deaths as a Gola and remembering the horrific trauma of having to sit through this podcast. I thank you for bearing with us if you have bared with us. Sorry if you, um, if you got stuff spoiled for you that you didn't want spoiled, but go read the books and it'll be fine. And... God damn, we can't wait till 2023. But the thing is, one last point, right? When the when something's been out for so long, right? It's, I think. Sorry, you spoiled a 50 year old book. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's uh, a week old it, film. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a bit like that when Gandalf came back as well. That's what you bring up Lord oh. of the Rings again. But just like, the fucking book's ancient, <laughs> mate. Come on. You know, the one, the only yeah. reason I regret, I get really funny about this is because when the Harry Potter, Harry Potter books would come out, I'd read them in like three or four hours. Yeah. So when the one came out where Dumbledore dies, I'm really sorry if someone's finding out for the first time. Like a friend of mine called me and she was like, Nina, what happens in the books? Because it was like like 3 a.m. on release day. And I was like, are you sure? Because like this was the biggest Harry Potter spoiler essentially you could give someone. She was like, I, I was like, are you sure you want to know? It's really, really big. Are you do you definitely want me to tell you? Yeah. She was like, yeah, please, please, please tell me. And so I was like, okay, Dumbledore dies. And she just started crying and <laughs> screaming at me. And she was like, why did you tell me? The why fuck? didn't you just not tell me? You should have told me. And I was like, you asked me to tell you. <laughs> so now I, I kind of, I think that's given me like a, a knee jerk fear of, of accidentally spoiling things for people. Yeah, that's fair enough. Yeah, I'm sorry if, um, yeah, Dumbledore dies. All right, spoilers. Spoilers. He deserved it. Treat Harry like shit anyway. But yeah, Dumbledore but is like definitely. But fuck it, I refuse to speak about Harry Potter. So I'm ending that there. Fuck Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> Good <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> Thank you for listening. <laughs> if you want us to do a Harry Potter review, we won't. <laughs> and not in a million fucking years. <laughs> See you guys. Thanks so Until much next for listening. Time.